if you grew up as a kid in the church, then you probably experienced some sort of age-appropriate Christian education. Um, Jason Santos is the mission coordinator for Christian formation at the Presbyterian Mission Agency. His Ignite is called Chilling, Killing Church Softly. He's going to talk to you about that. And your drinking buzzword is generational theory. Introducing Jason Santos. For over a decade, we've witnessed a gradual shift in North American Christianity, particularly among 20 and 30-somethings. Largely associated with the millennial generation, young adults have demonstrated their discontentment with the institutional religion in, most, in the most powerful way imaginable, through their absence. Some sociologists argue that we're seeing a shift in how we understand adulthood, traditionally defined by markers like the completion of education, marriage, a house, children. They're all checked off later in life, if at all. Theoretically, once these markers are met, they should return to the church, but we all know that's not happening. I'd like to suggest, however, that there is more at play than this, in this shift than the extension of one's transition into adulthood. I'd argue that we're seeing another major shift in the history of the church, away from Constantinian Christianity and towards something closer to the early church, where Christian community was participatory, communal, and oriented around ritual. As the church navigates this broader shift, it is critical that we examine our ecclesial context through the lens of generational theory. Strauss and Howe argue that every 20 some years we see a cyclical change in how each successive generation understands themselves in relationship to the broader culture and the evolution of Western civilization. Let's take a look at the last four. The silent generation were the survivors who came of age in an era shaped by the Great Depression, the Second World War, and other tragic events. Helping to rebuild the country on the heels of the previous generation, they focused on strengthening societal institutions through civil participation. Largely characterized by a cultural morality, they conflated Christianity with good citizenship. The baby boomers, came of an age during the massive changes of our culture. Where are we at here? Prompted, in, prompted by the boom in psychological research that led to the civil rights movement, women's liberation, and the sexual revolution, each championing the values of the individual, sanctioning a generation to embrace therapeutic individualism unabashedly. Generation X, no surprise, found themselves left to their own devices. These latchkey kids were the smallest generation of the past century and notably the most despondent, highly distrusting of institutions, particularly religious ones. They're often characterized as having a deistic view of God, echoing the abandonment of their childhood. And the millennials, not only are they the biggest generation, but they're also the ones that take the most selfies. As the first technological natives, they are the most individualistic and diverse. They are unfairly stereotyped as self-absorbed, but millennials are also known for their collaboration and social activism. They're also among the most studied. In 2005, the National Study of Youth and Religion argued that not only we are doing a poor job of handing down faith, that the faith that we're handing down is lacking. They labeled it moral therapeutic deism. MTD is the belief that religion teaches us what is right and wrong, it helps us feel good about life, and that God is not concerned with our everyday lives. Generationally speaking, this is a far cry from the civic Christianity of the silent generation that understood the church as a pastoral institution that offered spiritual comfort and moral formation. After World War II, religious communities experienced a surge in attendance and the pastoral model lost its efficacy giving rise to a more programmatic model. This trajectory, undergirded by the rise of developmental psychology, empowered our boomer leaders to develop more age and stage ministries as a means to address the needs of specific age groups. These peer-oriented efforts moved the spiritual formation of our youth and children farther from the multi-generational body to the fringes of our community. The result? a Van Gogh Mickey Mouse, where our children and youth were removed from the corporate life of the church and were increasingly formed in the peer-oriented, fun and games, snack-filled programming of Mickey's ear. 
Perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised when our youth abandoned the church. It was never theirs to begin with. These shifts in the church, coupled with the rampant individualism of the boomer era, have left our young people, in the words of Robert Putnam, bowling alone. They no longer trust the consumeristic culture of boomer Christianity, nor do they relate to the institutional Christianity of the silent generation. The millennials have left the building. Lacking a deeper connection to their faith communities, they set on a path of self-discovery and identity formation. Fortunately for them, our technology affords them the luxury of connecting globally with people who are most like themselves, young adults without an anchored identity. Borrowing from Peter Berger's theory on identity formation, we find that when a young person's primary socialization fails to anchor a cohesive and to a great extent communal identity during childhood, it becomes far more difficult to navigate the other worldviews later in life. Instead, a patchwork self emerges on the shores of adulthood. Even more, situated learning theory suggests that identity formation through increased participation in communities of practice form them the best. Like the rings of a concentric circle, as someone participates in the rituals of a community, they move from an outsider position to an insider position, procuring a deep sense of belonging. These assertions, paired with the neuroscience behind communal memory theory, offer a compelling argument for an intergenerational approach to ritualized practice within the context of a religious community. In other words, when we do important stuff together, intergenerationally, a communal memory is formed and sustained by all. This communal memory functions like a lock within our habitus, the ingrained dispositions that orient our lives and actions without us even realizing it. Though they've developed throughout their lifespans, the foundational memories are stored during childhood. It is our job to make sure that that foundational memory includes all generations. There is truth behind the proverb, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. At the end of the day, if we want our young people to be connected to the church, we must first address what's killing it. Peer-oriented ministry cannot and never should have been the primary way we are forming them in the faith. There is no magic bullet or prepackaged solution to correcting the malaise we're witnessing among our younger generations toward the church, but there are things we can do to help reverse this trend, and I believe those things begin intergenerationally. <laughs>